Mathieu, I'll let you uh, introduce yourself, and you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you. So, hi everyone. Thanks for being here uh, this morning, even though uh, the gala was yesterday evening. Uh, unless you were living in a desert island with no internet access during the last year, you have probably heard about quite some big issues around Microsoft Exchange. The attacks were deemed so important by uh, the FBI that they decided uh, to remove themselves the malicious web shells on compromised servers located in the US. In this presentation, I'm going to present a year in review of uh, Microsoft Exchange exploitation, and I will discuss both the proxy logon and the proxy shell vulnerabilities and their variations. Uh, we will discuss how multiple cyber espionage groups abuse these vulnerabilities to take over thousands of mail servers, in particular in March and August. I'm Mathieu Tarta, and I am a malware uh, researcher at ESET. So let's start with the proxy logon vulnerability. This Microsoft Exchange vulnerability is actually not one single vulnerability, but a set of four different vulnerabilities that together are known as proxy logon. When they are chained together, we get a pre-authentication remote code execution vulnerability, meaning that the attackers don't need a valid user account to be able to execute arbitrary commands on an unpatched exchange server. These vulnerabilities affect the three most recent versions of uh, Microsoft Exchange, namely uh, Microsoft Exchange uh, 2013, 16, and 19. The cloud versions, uh, Exchange Online, are, are Outlook 365 are not affected by these vulnerabilities. So let's have a look at the timeline of events. So according to Volexity, the earliest in the wild exploitation of uh, proxy logon happened on the 3rd of January. And an important point uh, to note is that this was before the vulnerabilities were reported to Microsoft by Oren Chai, who is uh, a security researcher. On uh, February 2021, we started seeing more APT groups that started to exploit the vulnerability. And on March 2nd, Microsoft finally released an out-of-band patch uh, that was initially scheduled for the week after in the regular patch Thursday. The very next day, on March, March 3rd, we observed the start of mask's exploitation of proxy logon. So it was not longer, no longer targeted, and multiple different attackers uh, were trying to take over as many vulnerable servers as possible before they were patched. And that timeline suggests that Afnium got the vulnerability first, and that the other APT groups that exploited uh, the vulnerability start starting uh, on the 28th of February, got it in a separate leak or from a different source. But we cannot know for sure. So let's have a look at some statistics. This graph represents uh, ESET's detection for the web shells uh, that were dropped by the attacker during the exploitation of vulnerable exchange servers. So before the patch release, the volume uh, was quite limited and even null before uh, February 28th. But as you can see on that graph, just after the release of the patch, the number of exploitation attempts uh, strongly increased and it was pretty high during the next few days following the, the release of the patch. On March 4th, uh, Shodan published some statistics about uh, vulnerable exchange servers uh, that were accessible from the internet. So you see that the number is quite high and uh, more than 250,000 servers were vulnerable. So since attackers were doing mass scanning to find such uh, server, it's quite likely that most of them were compromised. The fact that this vulnerability didn't require any valid credentials uh, is the reason that allowed attackers to perform uh, mass scanning and that allowed them to compromise very quickly most of the unpatched server. So 
how are the, how is the proxy logon vulnerability uh, used by the attacker? Uh, first, the attacker need to exploit CV 2021-26855, which is a vulnerability that allows an attacker to authenticate into any reachable exchange servers without any credentials. Then, chain with the three other vulnerabilities, it allows the attacker to install a web shell, which is a small ASPX script on the server. And these web shells, which are of the China Chopper family, uh, were typically installed in the ASP.NET client folder under a vast variety of names, as you can see there. Uh, so uh, since the file names are attacker control, we can use these file names to cluster and then attribute uh, these attacks. Uh, an interesting characteristic of the web shells that were deployed uh, that are once again from the China Chopper family, is that they were stored in a, an exchange offline address book in the external URL field, as you can see there. And in that particular example, example uh, the attackers can execute arbitrary commands using the HTPost field load. But dropping that web shell is just the first step for the attackers. Uh, the attackers can then come back a few minutes or sometimes even a few days after the exploitation in order to execute commands on the server. So to do so, the attacker browses uh, to the URL where the web shell is located and they send uh, a post, uh, uh, they, they send their command embedded into a post parameter to that particular URL. This command is then interpreted by the web server that is running on uh, the Exchange server. And these commands can then be used by the attacker to drop some additional executables, for example, to install a complex backdoor on, on the server. But the attacker can also choose to not deploy any malware on the server and just directly dump full mailboxes from the server without the need of any additional malware component. Now that we've seen how these vulnerability work, uh, let's move on to the in the wide reality by looking uh, into more details at the threat actors we've observed exploiting the vulnerability. So during the first week of exploitation, we uncovered an entire bestiary of threat actors with at least 10 different APT groups that were exploiting the proxy logon vulnerability. On uh, several occurrences, we even saw multiple threat actors deploying their malware on the very same exchange server. And since the vulnerability is a pre-authentication vulnerability, once again, any threat actor could scan the internet to find vulnerable exchange server, which means that multiple threat actors may attempt to compromise the same server at the same time or they can also scan the internet to find uh, web shells deployed on Exchange Server and take, uh, uh, take advantage of these already exploited servers. The first known threat actor that exploited the vulnerability was attributed by Microsoft to a group they called uh, Afnium. And we believe that none of the 10 APTs we've observed and that I will uh, present afterward uh, uh, we've observed in March are actually Athenium. So most of the time when you hear about proxy logon, you hear about uh, the Athenium APT group, but there are actually a whole heap of APT groups that exploited it. And if you want more detail about Athenium, you can refer to the, the MS uh, blog post uh, for more details. So let's start with the first group that uh, we've seen exploiting the, the vulnerability, which is TIC. TIC uh, uh, started exploiting the vulnerability in February 28th, and they compromised the mail servers, the mail server of a company based in East Asia that provide, provide IT services. Uh, since the patch was released on March 2nd, uh, once again, it means that TIC had prior knowledge of the vulnerability. Uh, TIC is a pretty old cyber espionage group that is active since at least 2008, and their main objectives are 
IP and classified information theft. And uh, in the past, we've seen them targeting the industrial sector, uh, the defense and, and military sector, as well as government organization. And the victims are mostly, but not exclusively, based uh, in uh, Russia, uh, Japan, and South Korea. So TIC toolset include the Royal World uh, RTF weaponizer, but they have some custom backdoors so such as Dazerf, Datper, they also use XXMM. Uh, they make use also of the Lilith rat, which is an open source rat, and they are no part of the group that have access to the Shadowpad backdoor. On the compromised uh, mail server, uh, they deployed their web shell under the file name ASP.NET. ASPX, and uh, we managed to attribute that uh, compromise to TIG because they tried to deploy a Delphi backdoor uh, that they, uh, they are, they've already used in the past. One day after TIG, uh, on March 1st, uh, Lucky Mouse joined the party and they started to exploit the vulnerability by compromising the email server of a governmental entity in the Middle East. Lucky Mouse is also known as APT27 or Emissary Panda. This is an APT group that have quite some good technical uh, capabilities. Uh, they are known for uh, targeting uh, government organization in the Middle East, Central Asia, East Asia, and they also have uh, compromised uh, the civil aviation organization in Canada. So Lucky Mouse uh, has a set of custom implants. They use their Hyperbore backdoor, sysupdate backdoor. They also make use of uh, plugix, and they also have their own rootkit, which is called NDIS proxy. And they also like to use the Regiord web shell. Uh, the main action we observed on the compromised mail server was that they tried to deploy NBT scan in the program data folder and they uh, used the Regiorge web shell. Uh, additionally, they tried to deploy uh, their sysupdate backdoor, which is a modular implant. Uh, the implant is loaded using DLL search order hijacking and you will never see the, the payload uh, on disk. It's only encrypted on disk and the, the plain text payload is only uh, in memory. On the same day, uh, Lucky Mouse was quickly followed by Calypso, who compromised the email servers of governmental entities in the Middle East and South America. In the following days, Calypso operators also targeted uh, servers of governmental entities and private companies in Africa, Asia, and Europe. Uh, Calypso was first documented by Positive Technologies in 2019, it's a cyber espionage group that is believed to be active since 2017, and they are mostly targeting government organization. Their toolset includes the Calypso rat, which uh, gave uh, them their name. They also use Plugix and the Whitebird backdoor. On the compromised uh, email server, they uh, they try to load some DLL using DLL search order hijacking with the following uh, DLL side loading host that you can see there. And the implants they used are uh, Plugix and Whitebird. Still the 1st of March, another group, which we call WebSeq, also started exploiting the vulnerability. They targeted several email servers belonging to private companies in IT, telecommunications, and engineering, uh, mostly in Asia, but also a governmental body uh, in Eastern Europe. Um, we didn't manage to tie WebSeq to any known uh, threat actor, but it's a cyber espionage group that is active since at least 2021, and once again, it's a group that mostly targets government organization. And their toolset includes the WebSeq backdoor. So on the compromised mail server, we've seen them uh, deploying uh, the web shells under google.aspx and google.log uh, file names. Uh, the first stage is, uh, they use is a loader that's loaded uh, an encrypted configuration with file name access.log. 
And uh, their second stage is once again a loader that was uh, deployed at the following location. But we didn't manage to get uh, the first stage, so we don't actually know what uh, they intended to deploy on, on the victim's machine. And last but not least, among the group that exploited the vulnerability before the release of the patch by Microsoft, meaning the groups that had access to the vulnerability uh, prior to that patch, uh, the WinNTR group on March 2nd. Uh, a few hours before the release of the patch, they compromised the email server of an oil company and a construction equipment company both based in East Asia. Uh, the WinNTI group is also a cyber espionage group that is active since at least 2011, 2012, and their targeting is very broad, so I won't even show a map because uh, most countries will, will be colored, and they are targeting a broad range of uh, organization. And uh, one characteristic of the WinNTI group is that they also very frequently use uh, stolen, certificate, stolen code signing certificates from previous campaigns to sign their malware. So the WinNTI use makes, makes use, of course, of the WinNTI malware, they also use uh, ZX shell, they uh, have custom uh, implants of, such as the port we use, passive backdoor, uh, Pipemon that we both documented on WeLeaf security. Uh, they frequently use a credential dumper that is called ACEHASH, and it's the, the first group that had access to the Shadowpad backdoor. They deploy their web shell in the caches.aspx and shell. As, uh, with fine name caches.aspx and shell.aspx. And the implant they use uh, on the compromised mail server, uh, we saw the WinNTI loader, plug extract, the spider backdoor, and Mimikat and some other custom password dumping tools. One day after the release of the patch by Microsoft, Tonto team joined the party, and they compromised the email servers of a procurement company uh, and a consulting company specialized in software development and cybersecurity in Eastern Europe. Uh, Tonto team mostly targets uh, government institutions based mostly but not exclusively in Russia, Mongolia, and Japan. It's a cyber espionage group. And like TIC, it's a pretty old uh, APT group, as they are active since at least 2009. Uh, they have their own set of custom backdoor. Their flagship backdoor is called uh, Bisonal, and they have been using that backdoor for more than 10, 10 years, so there are a lot of evolutions since uh, the first, first variant. Uh, was first observed. Uh, they also used the Royal Road RTF weaponizer, uh, Dexbia, and they are now also part of the group that have access to uh, Shadowpad. The main action we've observed is that they deployed their web shell with some pretty particular name, uh, the Kai by SSSS.ASPX. Uh, and they tried to deploy some PowerShell downloader used to uh, download uh, and load the Bisonal RAT and also Shadowpad. Speaking of Shadowpad, on the very same day we observed some Shadowpad related activity on email servers at a software company based uh, in East Asia and a real estate company based in the Middle East. Uh, Shadowpad was dropped by the attacker, but we are not able to conclusively attribute uh, that activity to uh, any known group. So Shadowpad is now shared among multiple threat actors since uh, 2019. Uh, for example, Tonto team have access to it, WinNTI group, TA428, Tick, Sparkling Goblin, Red Fox Rot, Red Echo, Fishmonger, uh, you name it. It's not even an exhaustive list. And um, to attribute Shadowpad to a particular uh, APT group, you can use, because it's a modular backdoor, so you can use the number of modules because different groups don't have access to the same number of modules. The, the encryption algorithm that is used, uh, the content of the encrypted uh, configuration, but also the the CNC server, so there are many different ways to attribute uh, 
uh, shadow pad uh, implant to, to, to a particular group, but in that case, we weren't able to uh, conclusively attribute uh, this compromise. Still on March 3rd, uh, we noticed uh, a cluster of cobalt strike related malicious activities worldwide that we dubbed the Opera Cobalt Strike. Um, the targeting was quite broad. We saw more than 750 targets all around the world. We believe that that cluster of activity is likely a cyber espionage group, but we don't know for sure. And uh, they are active since uh, 2021, because that's the first time we, we saw them. And uh, the, the targeting was quite broad, uh, and but not a lot of machines received the, 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 the next stage. Like they, they targeted like 50 machines, around the 750 machines, to deploy uh, their next stage. So as their name suggests, uh, they, the, the implant they use is Cobalt Strike. And they deployed their web shells in a different folder than uh, the ASP.NET uh, client uh, that you've seen previously. They used the HTTP proxy OWA auth folder with the file name that you can see on the slide. And to deploy Cobalt Strike, they used a Cobalt uh, PowerShell script. And uh, to load the payload, they used DLS or shoulder hijacking on the Opera browser executable. And that's why we call that cluster of activity the, the Opera Cobalt Strike. The day after, on March 4th, we observed the Microsine APT group starting to exploit the vulnerability and compromising the exchange server of a utility company in Central Asia. And Microsyn is, once again, a cyber espionage group that is active since 2017. They are also known as Six Little Monkeys, and they mainly target governmental uh, institutions and telecommunication operators in Central Asia, Russia, and Mongolia. Their arsenal includes uh, the Microsyn backdoor, but also uh, the Ghost Rat. Uh, on the compromised mail server, they used uh, different file names, as you can see there. They tried to deploy the micro scene rat and also a custom uh, proxy named calcex.exe uh, with the following command line that you can see there, and uh, mimikatz. And finally, on March 4th and 5th, we detected the deployment of some PowerShell downloaders related to uh, a group we call DLT Miner on multiple email servers around the world. So here it's uh, the first financially motivated group that we've seen exploiting uh, proxy logon. Uh, they are uh, known as Sapphire Pigeon, and they are active since at least 2019, and they don't have any particular targeting. An interesting point is that DLT Miner was active on March 4th and fifth only. Then we didn't see any activity from that group on uh, Exchange Server after that, that date. Uh, they tried to deploy some PowerShell downloader, but also Mimikatz. And we are not sure uh, if they had access to the exploit or if they actually hijack uh, existing uh, previously deployed uh, web shells. Uh, we are not sure because the web shells file names were different between each victims. So usually we use the file names to do a first clustering, but in that case, the file names were different in every cases, and they were not following, following any particular pattern. So that's why we believe that it's quite likely that uh, this group just hijacked uh, previously deployed uh, web shells. Uh, if you want to know more about uh, these APT groups that exploited Microsoft Exchange, you can have a look at uh, the blog post we published last year about, uh, about it. But is it just the tip of the iceberg? Uh, a presentation from OrangeSci, who discovered Proxylogon, uh, was scheduled on August uh, 5th last year. And, that, and it was uh, meant to present a new critical exchange vulnerability. So at that time, we believe that, well, it was actually just the tip of the iceberg because 
One day before Arantxa's presentation, some researchers started to notice some exchange servers exploitation attempt using what seemed like a new technique. And it appears that this new vulnerability was actually the same vulnerability that will be presented the day after by Orensai at Black Hat USA. And this vulnerability was named Proxy Shell. So let's have a look at Proxy Shell and its variations. So Proxy Shell, as in the case of Proxy Logon, is actually a vulnerability chain which consists in three different vulnerabilities. Uh, when chained together, these three vulnerabilities led to pre-authentication remote code execution, once again, as in the case of proxy logon. And uh, again, uh, the vulnerable action server were exchanged 2013, 16, and 19. Here, uh, the exploitation is a little bit different, but it still looks fa quite familiar to what I showed you regarding proxy logon. First, uh, the attacker needs to exploit a server-side uh, request for the bypass to be able to interface with the PowerShell backend, and then a privilege escalation to be able to execute arbitrary commands. Then the attacker can exploit the last vulnerability, which is a post-authentication arbitrary file write, uh, which uh, will uh, allow to use the mailbox, new mailbox export request to export our mailbox where the attacker previously created an email that contained an encoded web shell. Uh, that mailbox uh, will be then exported as a PST file with a web file extension, .aspx, and this will lead to the decoding of that malicious web shell that will be written on disk with different file name, and once again, these file names are attacker controlled, so it allows, it will help us to uh, clusterize and attribute uh, the campaigns. But there are also some alternative explo exploitation paths where instead of making use of a malicious PST file, the attacker can also use a certificate request to achieve the same goal by using the new exchange certificate commandlet. In that case, the web shell will have the, the ASPX.rec extension, but at the end, you end up with a web shell on, on the exchange server the same way. Uh, an attacker can also choose to just exploit the two first vulnerability to be able to create new mailboxes with full access permissions using the following commandlet. So a new mailbox, new road group member, and I'll add the mailbox permissions. So now that we've seen the different exploitation path, let's have a look at the timeline. Uh, in March 2021, Orange discovered the proxy shell vulnerability chain, and in March and uh, May, uh, Microsoft published, uh, um, published a security update addressing these vulnerabilities. Then on the 2nd of August, uh, some unsuccessful proxy shell exploitation attempts were observed. And the day after, uh, Orensai presentation took place at Black Hat. Then on the 12th of August, we started seeing the first proxy shell exploitation. And finally, a few days after that, uh, the CISA released uh, their alert. So let's have a look at the exploitation statistics. This graph represents ESET detection. Once again, for the web cells that were dropped by the attacker during the exploitation of the vulnerable exchange server, but for proxy shell this time. So what can see, when it, we can see that uh, we started seeing the first exploitation attempt on August 12th, and that one week later, the, the proxy shell vulnerability started to be massively exploited by both cybercrime and cyber espionage group. And Let's have a look at the few groups that we've seen exploiting the vulnerability during the first month of exploitation. Here we'll focus only on the first month, as I said, and on August 12th, we observed uh, the proxy shell uh, vulnerability uh, being exploited by a threat actor we are not able to conclusively attribute to any known groups, and we named that cluster of activity application update. Uh, that threat actor targeted several exchange server uh, all based in the US, and the targeted organizations uh, were 
from the health sector, construction and engineering, and some government organizations. So as I said, we didn't currently tie the uh, application update to any known threat actor. And on the compromised uh, mail server, they deployed uh, two executables, uh, one called create I task, which is used to create a scheduled task that is responsible for loading the second executable, application update, which is responsible for downloading uh, the, the next stage. So it will contact the staging server that you can see on the slide. Uh, but Unfortunately, uh, we weren't able to retrieve the next stage from uh, that server. You may remember TA410 from Alex and Matt uh, presentation from Wednesday. So, well, the day after application update on August 13th, we, they compromised our religious organization in Central Europe. And uh, APT410, uh, uh, as uh, you've seen during uh, the previous presentation, they are targeting the industrial and academic sector mostly. Uh, it's a cyber espionage group active since 2018. And um, it's, uh, com it's, it's three different subgroups, actually. Uh, they use different implants, such as FlowCloud, Loopback, uh, X4, but they also use the PlugX rat, Quasar rat, and as many groups have you seen previously, they use the railroad document uh, RTF weaponizer. Um, on the, the compromised mail server, they try to deploy uh, the PlugX loader, which uses lokt.ine as log file, and that particular file name was used in the past by uh, TA410. Uh, they also uh, tried to deploy the loopback backdoor, uh, which is a modified uh, libcurl DLL, and they tried to drop it at uh, the following location. If you want to know more about uh, TA410, you can have a look at the blog post that was published uh, on Wednesday, right after uh, Matt and Alex presentation. Then uh, on uh, August 24th, uh, we observed TA428 exploiting the vulnerability, and they targeted the European Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, so TA428 is once again a cyber espionage group. They are, they are active since at least 2014, and they are targeting mostly government organizations based uh, in Russia and Mongolia. And uh, they are also responsible for a supply chain attack against a software development company uh, in Mongolia. Um, their toolset includes the Railroad RTF uh, weaponizer. You're, you're probably quite familiar with it now. Uh, they have some uh, custom backdoor, uh, such as the Timanger backdoor and Albany Utas. They also make use of PlugX, and they are part of the group that have access to Shadowpad. On the compromised uh, mail server, they uh, deployed some .NET and VM protected loaders that are used to uh, deploy some encrypted fail payload with various uh, file names. But since the first stage was blocked, we weren't able to collect uh, such encrypted payloads. And a few days after uh, TA428, on uh, August 21st, we observed Sparkling Goblin starting to exploit the vulnerability against a Hong Kong University, which is quite a common target for that threat actor. Um, Sparkling Goblin mostly overlaps with uh, APT41 and Barium, and so it's a cyber espionage group that is active since at least 2018 and um, they are targeting uh, a broad range of organizations, mostly based in East and Southeast Asia, and their targets include uh, religious organizations, the industrial sector, the academic sector, government organization, media outlet, e-commerce platform, uh, you name it. There are a lot of organizations that are targeted by that group. Uh, they make use of some install util base loader. They have some custom backdoors, such as the crosswalk backdoor and its little sister sidewalk. Um, they make use of Cobalt Strike and PlugX quite interchangeably, and they also use uh, Shadowpad. 
And on the compromised mail server, we saw them trying to deploy their usual install util uh, based .NET loader. And finally, one month after Orange Eye's presentation at Black Hat USA, we observed Red Fox Trot targeting the exchange server of an IT company in Pakistan, which is uh, a country that is commonly targeted by Red Fox Trot. And uh, it's a cyber espionage group that is active since 2018. Uh, they target the research sector, aviation, mining companies, telecommunication operators, governmental organization, uh, all based uh, in Central Asia. And on the compromised uh, mail server, they try to deploy a shadow pad. And in that case, we're able to attribute that particular shadow pad activity to Red Fox Red because they reused uh, a domain name that they used in previous campaigns. So if you want to know more about the APT group that exploited uh, the proxy shell vulnerability, we can have a look at the public threat report we published uh, at the beginning uh, of the year on Willif security. So to conclude, let's discuss the mitigations of uh, such attacks. So First thing first, if you haven't done so yet, please patch your Microsoft Exchange servers. Uh, in case of a compromise, which is quite likely if you didn't patch, uh, patching is of course not enough. And oh, sorry, uh, first thing first, also avoid to uh, expose your Outlook uh, web app uh, directly to internet because that's how the attackers manage to scan the internet to find victims. And if you were compromised, uh, of course, change uh, your credentials and uh, of course, look for web shells that are present on uh, the exchange uh, server and remove them, but also investigate uh, malicious activity on your network because it's quite likely that the operators uh, pivoted on, on other machines uh, in your network. So that's pretty much it for me. Uh, if you have any question. That was a great overview. Any questions? Yes, sir. You moved in the room. Uh, thanks a lot for the talk. Very interesting. And indeed, as uh, Eric thanks. said, uh, a really nice overview. Um, one comment on the, like, how to defend. Uh, basically, this is also, I think, belie I believe it's part of Microsoft strategy. As you said, Microsoft uh, on-prem is vulnerable, yeah. but not on cloud. And we had several constituents that have moved to the cloud as a result of this. Okay, so vendor locking. Uh, one way to um, uh, uh, free yourself of proxy log on a proxy shell. Um, and now one question, or like, um, as you clearly highlighted in your talk, uh, several threat actors, starting by Hafnium, got access to the uh, vulnerability before uh, it was patched. So in your, um, in your opinion, would it mean that, for example, they have targeted security researchers, such as Orange Tsai himself, to get access? Uh, or could it be that they had independent, I would say, um, uh, research that got them access to this chain? Uh, of vulnerabilities, not only one. Um, so I would be curious to um, get your educated mm -hmm. guesses uh, into that. Thank you. So uh, there are different hypotheses, and probably different threat actors didn't have access to the vulnerability the same way. For example, probably Afnium didn't get the vulnerability by the same means as the other groups, because you can see that there is clearly a time gap between the exploitation. So, a possibility, as you mentioned, is that some, uh, some um, RNSI was targeted and they stole the exploit from him. From him. It could be that uh, the, the exploit was shared by Microsoft uh, through MAP to some security company that leaked the exploit to some, uh, to some threat actors. Uh, so everything is, is possible, and of course we, we will never know for sure for every case. So, thank you. Thank you. There's another question up there. Erwin.
Thank you for the talk. Uh, you um, uh, mentioned that Hafnium was the first retractor and uh, for proxy logon vulnerability in, on mm -hmm. 3rd January. And I think in your graphical uh, chart, you there were, were some detections prior to 3rd of January. So did you see something prior to that or? No, we didn't see anything prior to, 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 to this. And then a second question uh, about the shadow pad. Mm -hmm. That shadow pad uh, samples that you could not attribute, are there those that you listed in your blog post? Uh, yep. OK, so well, in my personal opinion, I, I think they are from Calypso threat actor. So one group that you already listed exploiting this. OK, so maybe it so was also. It, and it was also based on what you m meant on the encryption algorithm that was used. So. Oh, because of the encryption algorithm you managed to attribute to Calypso? OK, that's, that's interesting. I will recheck these samples. Thanks. <laughs> OK, any other question? Don't be shy. One, two. Three. Okay, thank you very much, Mathieu.